Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. My name is Ann Kinseth, and I'm the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum. And we are so pleased to have you all um, in our very first online course, Curator's Choice, Spanish Art in Britain and Ireland. Uh, and we're equally pleased to have the opportunity for the first time to bring us all together um, in a live Q&A session with uh, this week's speaker, Dr. Miriam Rosser Owen. Before we get started, I just have a couple notes of housekeeping. Um, first of all, I, I just want you all to be aware that we are recording this session and we will be posting um, the, the video of the Q&A to the course page um, in the coming week. Uh, secondly, you'll notice when you arrived in the session that your microphone is on mute and we, we kindly ask that you keep yourself on mute throughout the session so that we don't pick up any unnecessary background noise. Um, and I will be muting uh, participants as needed. Finally, um, this week we have about 30 minutes with our speaker and we want to be as respectful of her time as we possibly can be. So we will be starting the Q&A session with the questions that were submitted in advance through the course site, through the discussion forum. So thank you to those of you that took the time to do that. Um, we will be kind of as time permits, uh, introducing new questions. So should you have uh, an additional question, we're gonna invite you to type that into the chat box. And I will be sharing that with, with Dr. Uh, Rosser Owen, as well as my colleague, uh, Dr. Amanda Dotseth, who is the curator at the museum and is joining us today. So I am pleased to now kind of turn the presentation over to uh, Amanda Dotseth. Hello, and I have the absolutely wonderful task of introducing um, <clears throat> one of my favorite people, scholars and friends, uh, Dr. Mariam Rosser Owen, who is the curator responsible for the Arab World Collections at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. No small task. If anyone's been there, they, uh, you know how wonderful those collections are. She's been there since 2002, which incidentally is when she finished her PhD thesis at the University of Oxford. She specializes broadly in the material culture of the medieval Mediterranean, especially Al-Andalus and North Africa. Her book, Islamic Arts from Spain, published by the v in 2010, which I highly recommend, was written around the museum's collections to introduce the subject to the interested non-specialist. She has written widely on ivory in the middle medieval Mediterranean, and her recent articles on this subject focus on oliphants and the ivories made for women of the Andalusi court. She co-authored this book with Claire Anderson. Her most recent book is the multi-authored volume, The Alabids and Their Neighbors, Art and Material Culture in Ninth, Ninth Century North Africa, published by Brill in 2016. She is currently preparing a book based on her PhD thesis, and, and this focuses on the artistic and cultural patronage, patronage of the Amerid eight regions of Al-Andalus at the turn of the 10th and 11th centuries. And I will just add that she is also a, um, an associated scholar on a project with which I'm involved, which is the Medieval Iberian Treasury in Context, Collections, Connections, and Representations on the Peninsula and Beyond. And that project in particular deals with the um, objects of Islamic manufacture that ended up in Christian church treasuries, which I know, so, uh, I believe one of the questions addressed. Um, so I will now turn it over to Miriam, and I believe she's sort of prepared some um, initial responses to the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Thank you very much for that extremely kind introduction. It's really lovely to be with you all. Um, do you want to ask, read out the questions, Amanda, or? Um, Let's um, see. Do you have, let me see, do you have them to hand, Anne? Maybe. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to kick, kick this off. Um, so um, again, thank you to those of you that submitted questions in advance. We're, we're just going to kind of go one by one to, to address your curiosities. Um, so the first question comes from Susan Watts, who, Miriam, she is, she's interested in um, provenance or kind of the history of ownership of these, some of these objects. 
And she's also curious about the excavation process at Medina Azara. So I thought it would be useful um, in responding to the questions that were sent in advance to show you some more images. So just to kick off with the one about um, how objects came into the, the possession of their current owners. I mean, I'm just going to focus on the V&A collection because otherwise we could be talking about this for the, for the whole half hour. Um, I just prepared a slide that shows you all of the um, Andalusi ivories in the V&A. So uh, my presentation focused on uh, this one and this one, and, the, uh, and I, I mentioned this one as well, but um, the sort of groups associated with them, especially the ivories made for women at the Khalifa court. But um, we're so lucky in the V&A to be able to have um, seven uh, Andalusi ivories. Um, and I, the, the two that I didn't show in my presentation are these two. Uh, they're not on display at the moment, but they're, they're two kind of isolated panels from caskets. And um, I've, I've put them here. So this part of the object number is the year that they came into the V&A collection. So this is 1855. So I've kind of grouped them by, um, by year of um, acquisition. Um, and what we, what we know about these objects, sadly, I mean, the v &A was founded in 1852, and these are some of the very earliest acquisitions of the museum. And at that stage, the museum wasn't really um, keeping documentation, or at least the documentation doesn't survive to, to the 21st century. So we don't have any information about where these came from. Um, the way the museum was collecting at that period, though, was generally from private collectors, so um, possibly these had already come into private collections um, and or, or were then sold in the kind of important art market cities such as such as Paris. So that, that's a possibility, but we really have no information. Um, this one we know was bought from um, a private, a dealer who was based in London, he operated in London, John Webb. But this is when, from this one is when we start to have uh, some information through the travels of John Charles Robinson, who was the v &A's first curator. And he did um, three buying trips to Spain, to the Iberian Peninsula in the 1860s, which was a very, uh, I'm very jealous of, of him being able to do this, but he was buying at a very uh, good time for, the, for uh, when, when objects were coming onto the art market. Uh, so this casket, he tells us that he bought it in Madrid. But alas, we don't know who he bought it from. Um, this one was bought from a priest in Leon. Um, and that sort of raises the issue of, um, of a process called desamortización that was, was taking place in the late 19th century in Spain when ecclesiastical treasuries were, were sort of disentailing their, their collections were being moved into national museums that were being founded at the time. So this is how the, the ivories and Spanish collections come to be there, uh, because they were moved to the important uh, museum collections that were founded then. Um, but also they were coming into the hands of private collectors and, and onto the art market. Um, and so this one, we know it was bought by the museum from somebody called Juan Facundo Riaño, who was a very significant figure in um, Spanish art history, uh, but also uh, in his relationship with the V&A because he was our specialist advisor on Spanish art from the 1870s to about the 1890s. And this object had come into his personal collection somehow, we don't know. Um, this one's a bit of an outlier because as you can see, all of the rest of them joined the collection in the 19th century, whereas this one came in in 1910 as part of a bequest from, from somebody who had a very, very important collection. Um, his name was George Salting. We know that he bought this casket in 1893 at the sale of another private collector, Spitzer. Um, but what we don't know is how, how the, the casket came into Spitzer's collection in the first place. So you can sort of piece information together. We just, you know, sometimes you can go back to the, the, the person who owned it before the museum, or you can go maybe back one step further, but often it's not possible to go further than that. Um, I mean, objects are still coming to light. So in, in, um, within the last couple of decades, a, a number of Andalusi ivories have appeared on the art market. 
um, they tend to come from the, the private collections of European aristocrats, but again, they're sold through auction houses and that information isn't readily available. So um, it's possible that there are, there are more of these objects out there that we just haven't, have, that haven't come to light yet. The second question was about um, the excavation process at Medina Tazahra and key items that have been revealed. Um, I mean, that's that's quite a big question that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on here because, um, the, I mean, the site was abandoned really in the beginning of the 11th century, so it's been plundered ever since. Um, and a lot of the material was taken all over Spain. Some of the marble capitals were taken even into uh, Morocco in the medieval period. Um, in terms of what's been found during the excavations over the last hundred years, I mean, they began in around 1911. There's a whole museum dedicated to them when, when you go to Cordoba. But I just wanted to give you two sort of examples of some of the really um, standout kinds of things that have been found. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of architectural decoration discovered. Um, and I mentioned that sort of painstaking jigsaw puzzle of trying to put it all back together and recreate some of the spaces. Um, but huge amounts of objects, including ceramics. Um, but then there's also this fascinating use of Roman sarcophagi um, in some of the courtyards at the site. Uh, they seem to have been used as fountain basins. Um, and then we have a couple of examples of very beautiful bronze uh, fountainheads. So they probably didn't survive below ground. I mean, they, um, this one, for example, turned up in um, a monastery very close to Medina to Zahra, just on the hillside next to it. So it's probable that it was recovered from the site at some earlier period and uh, possibly the 16th century when the monastery was founded um, and it survived there above ground. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we had a few questions um, about kind of the people who were who were creating these works of art. So Linda Paisley, Lourdes Rue, and Susanna Green all seem interested in this. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about who made the objects, kind of what their background were, how they were paid, where they created these objects, and how many um, how many people it took to make make these. So I, again, I, I just wanted to show you some more images. Um, uh, so the artisans themselves, we don't really have any historical information about that. So when I say historical, I mean, we don't, the, the surviving texts um, and historical sources we have don't really mention them. They're sort of below mention. Um, they, so what we, what we know about the people who actually made the objects is what we can sort of glean from the objects themselves and then objects that are related to them. Um, so there's probably, there's a hierarchy of um, artisan, artisanship, or at least, you know, there's a, there's a workshop process involved in, in making uh, these objects. Um, the people mentioned in the main inscriptions tend to be um, the people who were involved in commissioning the objects, sort of liaising between the, the commissioner and the recipient. Um, and sometimes we know these people's names from historical sources, so we can build up a little bit more information about their biographies. I just wanted to show you, so this is one of the objects that I showed in my presentation, this one down here. Sorry, we only have these very bad black and white images because this um, casket's very badly published. It's still in a ecclesiastical collection. Um, but I just wanted to highlight, so this is the side of the casket where um, the craftsman's signature is located. So this is where it says this was made by Khalaf. Um, and it, this is kind of unusual in that it takes up quite a lot of space in the inscription. Normally the artisan's um, signatures are hidden. I'll, I'll show you some examples in a moment. So it's possible the fact that he names himself and in quite a prominent way is because he is the head of the workshop that created this casket but that's you know we don't we don't have more historical information on on that um, but one uh, casket that is particularly important from the point of view of the craftsman i mean it, from many points of view because this is the largest um, of the ivories to survive from 
Al Andalus, it's the, the length uh, along the front is 40 centimetres, it's, it's absolutely enormous. Uh, this, is, this survives in the museum in Pamplona. Um, and I just wanted to show you how basically every single face of this casket is signed by a different craftsman. So what's um, really interesting is that, so there's this panel on the lid that this casket was dismantled in the 1960s for a big conservation um, and clean. Um, and they discovered on the underside of this panel, this inscription here, which says that it was the work of Farage and his apprentices. Um, so that, that sort of gives us a lot of information about the fact that there was a master craftsman called Farage and he was working on this one object with a whole team of craftsmen. And he himself signed uh, this panel and it's possible that he worked on the whole of the lid of the, of the um, casket, which includes the inscription, which is, is probably one of the most tricky things to carve. Um, and then these, I've put in sort of red boxes, the, the name of the craftsman down here. So you can sort of see it's, it's hidden sort of under the foot of this figure here, who probably represents the patron of this casket. Or, um, you know, in the, the back of the, this deer over here, there's a, there's a kind of almost invisible craftsman signature. Um, and then this, is, this signature is on the back of the casket. Um, and th there's another example of Farage, po possibly the same Farage. So this is where we don't really know because the names are quite repetitive. So if we've got two objects signed by Farage, we don't know if it's the same person or if it's two different men called Farage. So there's another, this is a, a capital, sorry, in the, the Cordoba Archaeological Museum, which is signed again by a team of craftsmen. So there's, there's three signatures on here. This is Farage, possibly the same Farage because the chronology is very similar. It's probably also early 11th century. Um, but then we've also got Basha and, and Mubarak signing this casket. So we, it's a capital, sorry. Um, so we're just, we're kind of extracting information from the objects to try to, to, to piece together a picture of, of a workshop structure. Um, in terms of pay, we really don't have very much information about that. So it's possible that the people at the lower level who are actually doing the, the work, um, they were probably slaves. We have no idea whether they were paid or not. Um, the, the people at the higher level of the court administration, so the people involved in the kind of commissioning process, liaising between the, the commissioner and the, um, and the workshop, would have received salaries. So they, they, were, they were court administrators received salaries but also bonuses in the form of gifts um, from the caliph or whoever. Um, where they were made, I mean, what, what the question was, were they made in Africa or Iberia? The, these were definitely made in, in um, Iberia. Uh, two of the caskets that I showed in, in the lecture tell us that they were made at Medina Tazahra, the Palatine city outside Cordoba. But that's the only, um, that's the only evidence we have that there was a workshop at Medina to Zahra. I mean, the, it, we can be sure that they were made very close to the, to the heart of the court, just because of this fact that there were the same craftsmen probably involved in making ivories and in capitals, um, and the, the sort of stylistic uh, uniformity across both objects and uh, architectural decoration. Um, somebody asked if there could be independent workshops, or with, I mean, it's probable that the material, um, the ivory material, was, was a monopoly of the court. Uh, so it seems unlikely, but there we do have some examples of objects where the inscription is um, anonymous. So it doesn't name a particular patron. And, and it's been suggested that objects made for anonymous patrons might have been uh, made in a more kind of open market kind of setting. Um, maybe somebody came to the to the workshop and you know if they were willing to pay a good price then they would uh, be able to commission a, a casket as well but we we just have no historical evidence on that so we're, we're gathering it all from what we can tell from from the objects directly. Miriam is the idea that the material came over kind of in a raw form like like a tusk like a whole tusk? <laughs> that's what we think but again we just don't have any evidence so I think that's most likely mm -hmm. um, and then it was turned into objects it, uh, once it reached Cordoba. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So next question. Um, so Mary Newstead is interested in kind of the term is Islamic arts and how you feel like that is a field that's misnamed. Could you yeah. speak to that? I, I mean, I think when you hear the, the term Islamic art, you, you think it foregrounds the religion of Islam. And I think that's the problem with, with the name for the field. Um, because it's, it seems like it's equivalent to what we would call Christian art, where we're very much talking about um, art inside churches or for religious purposes. The same with Jewish art or Buddhist art, where, you know, that it foregrounds the religion. Um, and in what we call Islamic art, the, the art made for religious context is, is one tiny percentage of what we, what we have, what survives and, and what we study. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of the objects are made for palace uses like this or, or secular uses, daily life uses. Um, and it just so happens that um, the, the rulers of these, the cultures in which these objects were made were Muslim. So this is why this kind of vast geographical region and huge temporal region is put together and into one field called Islamic art. And, and now we have this issue about what do we call art made today? Is it contemporary Islamic art? Lots of the artists making contemporary art don't want to be labeled as making Islamic art. So it's, it's a difficult term, but it's, and it's been debated a lot. <laughs> within the field but nobody's yet come up with a an alternative term which is why we stick with it despite its uh, failings thank you so I, oh, oh sorry I, I noticed Miriam that um in your bio uh, the collections at the VNA are referred to as Arab or Arab world collections um yeah. is that has it always been that way or yeah, were they so called we, Islamic and then it changed or? No, the VNA department, so we, we sit within the Asian department. So we, mm. we classify our collection on geographical basis. Right. So right. I, I'm actually within the Middle Eastern section. So mm -hmm. I, even though I work on Spain, which is not in the Middle East and <laughs> North Africa, also not in the Middle East, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, we, it, we, you know, we have to kind of stretch these terms a little bit. So I guess we're thinking about the, the, the region that was under, you know, that was part of the, the kind of greater Islamic empire, if you're going to define it by the religion of the rulers. Thanks. Okay, so coming back to the ivories, um, Maria Lahiri is curious if ivory uh, was used for any other purpose than uh, creating these commemorative and personal gifts during the Umayyad court? So we don't have very much evidence um, for what else they could have been used for. Um, but it's probable, so there are some surviving objects like this one, it's a panel in the Metropolitan Museum um, in New York that was probably used um, to inlay into furniture. And um, we've got, it doesn't survive anymore, but we have textual descriptions of the minbar that was commissioned for the Great Mosque of Cordoba in the, in the 10th century. Um, and that includes uh, exotic woods, but also ivory in its description. So it's very possible that panels of ivory were um, also carved to be inlaid into that um, minbar. I mean, it's very likely that caskets were used for storing other kinds of precious objects, but we just don't have any evidence from what survives. The text um, that I sent you, uh, the article I sent you on the, on the um, ivories made for women uh, included a text about dif diplomatic gift, which quoted um, that one of the objects made from ivory was an ivory comb to comb the beard. So I think we can imagine that ivory is also being used to make um, items of personal adornment. I just wanted to show a couple of other objects. Um, so as, as the caskets are being sort of excavated, the, the material taken out to create the um, empty cavity inside the caskets, you know, the amount of ivory gets smaller and smaller, but it seems like even so that's still turned into objects. And this little pot on the left is, is tiny. It's only three and a half centimeters high, but it's, you know, made out of ivory and it's probably, you know, as, as you get smaller and smaller amounts remaining is still making things. Um, the other thing um, is, is chess pieces. Yeah. So this is a, yeah. So this is a chess piece here. 
Um, Sorry, <laughs> jumped ahead. <laughs> I was coming to it. <laughs> um, but we don't have very much evidence for, so we, that we know that chess was, was played in Islamic Spain because it's from Islamic Spain that it transferred to Christian Spain and thence to the rest of Europe. But we don't actually have much physical evidence. I mean, we've, we've, in archaeological sites, there are sort of chess boards scratched into rocks, but we don't have very many gaming pieces that have at least been identified as such or, you know, having been made in, in Al-Andalus. Um, there's this one in Dumbarton Oaks, which possibly just because of the sort of stylistic relationship of this um, animal figure to some of the ivories, um, it's, it's from Al-Andalus. So, I mean, I think it's likely that they were, it was being used for a, a range of different objects, but they're probably all objects that, you know, are associated with people who could afford it as a luxurious material. Somebody asked about um, burial purposes, and I know Amanda related to, um, referred to the relics earlier. So they're not, I mean, in Islamic burials, there are no objects, you don't take any objects with you. So um, a burial is extremely simple. It just involves the deceased being wrapped in a shroud and, and placed in, in a hole in the ground. So there are no burial goods. Um, they're not, the objects originally were not made to house human remains. That was what somebody else's question. But that's how they have come to be that's how they've come to survive, because many of them have survived in ecclesiastical treasuries for a thousand years as the containers for precious relics. So they have, in that sense, uh, housed human remains, but that wasn't the original intention <laughs> for why they were created. We, we will share um, one of Miriam's wonderful articles, actually, on that subject of the kind of transition of a, a an object created in a secular context um, move to a religious Christian context. So watch out. For yeah, that. there's a number of other readings I thought I could send around because um, just in response to some of the questions. So for example, the, the question about um, mounts and locks, um, I think, I mean, I did, I have a slide to show you, but I, I think we're getting short on time. So maybe we'll I don't know how you feel about um, carrying on with, with that question or not, but I'll certainly send maybe, the article through. <laughs> yeah, Miriam, maybe that would be a good question to end on. Um, okay. In our final three minutes, if you <laughs> address um, the question yeah. was from Maria Westfried, who was curious about the locks on many of the containers and if they were original, kind of what metal they were made from. Yeah, so we, we don't have very much, um, so the study of metal work at this period is, is not very developed, um, although there's quite a lot of interest in it at the moment. But I did write this little article, um, which I'll send you. Um, and there are some ways in which we can start to infer that the, the mounts are the originals. So um, on, on these two objects. I mean, I, I showed this object in, in the lecture, but this is a different view. It's very difficult actually to find a view which focuses in on the, the mounts because they tend not to be the, the side that people photograph. But um, so these two objects have survived in completely different contexts um, for you know over a thousand years and now they're in different collections, but they have basically identical mounts. Um, and this is the pair that I was talking about that they have an identical inscription. Um, they're probably both commissioned as a pair to celebrate the birth of a son. Um, but they, so they both have these two uh, silver, it's silver and niello, this black substance uh, that's inlaid into the silver is, is called niello. Um, and so I, I think it's pretty safe to say that the, the mounts on this are original and they relate to other tiny, there's tiny little examples of um, kind of almost like lockets that have been made in this kind of technique um, which probably again are you know you can use that to date those which is quite useful um, uh, the other the other object in the vna this one we we've done some scientific analysis on these mounts and it's not very easy to to interpret the results because in the absence of there being more scientific data to to compare it to but again, the, the mounts on this one seem to be silver gilt, at least this, this part of it. 
um, which might be original because it also relates a little bit to the technique used on this one, which um, is in the Hispanic Society. Um, but then there are parts of this mount that, that are made in a different material. So, for example, the lock plate, which seems to be a later replacement. I mean, if you think about it, this part of the mount, which is where you're going to be opening um, the lock to open the casket every time, is going to be very fragile and subject to, to breakages. So it's, it's quite likely that this part of the casket is going to break and be replaced over time. Um, somebody asked about how they work. I don't know if you can see on, on this one, it's got a little catch that comes through this hole here. So you would, you would kind of lift up the catch in order to lift up the mount and open the casket. Um, and they do, they are still pretty much functional. That was another question, but um, we tend not to, to use them if we can, because it obviously it puts a lot of stress on the mounts that we don't really want to, to, to put on them. Um, I wanted to show, so th these are obviously later, th these are later mounts. Um, they're probably 13th century, but we, again, we don't really have very much information about that. But because somebody asked if they were anti-aesthetic and um, I just, I mean, I think a lot of care has been taken to, to create beautiful mounts, even though they are later than, than the object. You know, they've got this rather lovely um, motifs down here and they've been gilded. Uh, care has been taken to follow the original placement of the mounts. So I think, you know, they're, they're, they're not, I mean, I see them as, as being part of the sort of life of the object and the stories that these objects lived after their original creation. So even if they are obviously much later, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I still, I still think they're lovely and beautiful and interesting. <laughs> well, Miriam, thank you so much for, I think, both the, the beautiful lecture that you put together and pre-recorded for us. And, and here it's almost like a second uh, presentation, which you've really tailored to everyone's questions. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't get through all of them. <laughs> well, I, we're thrilled that you'll be able to provide some follow-up articles, which I will be posting to the course and I'll share an announcement, um, which should generate an email to everyone's inbox to let you know when they're there. Yeah. But I also have to thank you, Miriam. Um, behind the scenes, you have just been absolutely lovely to work with. It's been a pleasure. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, for everyone in the course next Monday, I will be posting um, the next uh, of our speaker's video, Julian Harrison from the British Library, who will be discussing a manuscript called the Silos uh, Apocalypse. So mm -hmm. Same structure next week. We will accept questions in the discussion forum through Wednesday, which will forward to the speaker and then come back together again next week um, at 10.30 a.m. for our second Q&A session. And I also want to thank um, Amanda Dotseth for not only being here today, but behind the scenes, she has really kind of put together all the speakers that we have presented in this series. So I wanna thank her for all of her um, hard work and correspondence. This is why you guys are getting so much cool medieval stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for joining. And Miriam, we wish you a lovely um, weekend uh, in London. Thank you. Yes. yes, well, and the rest of you have a lovely day. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for joining. Bye.